Now this book is called The Borrowers and it used to be my favourite when, when I was a child growing up before my brother was born. And this story is particularly for Isla and I hope you enjoy it. It was Mrs May who first told me about them. No, not me. How could it have been me, a wild, untidy, self-willed little girl who stared with angry eyes and was said to crunch her teeth? Kate. She should have been called. Yes, that was it, Kate. Not that the name matters much either way. She barely comes into the story. Mrs May lived in two rooms in Kate's parents' house in London. She was, I think, some kind of relation. Her bedroom was on the first floor, and her sitting room was a room which, as part of the house, was called the breakfast room. Now, breakfast rooms are all right in the morning when the sun streams in on toast and marmalade, but by afternoon they seem to vanish a little, and to fill with a strange silvery light their own twilight. There is a sadness in them then, but then, as a child, it was a sadness Kate liked. She would creep into Mrs May just before tea time, and Mrs May would teach her to crochet. Mrs May was old, her joints were stiff, and she was not strict exactly, but she had that inner certainty which does instead. Kate was never wild with Mrs May, nor untidy, nor self-willed, and Mrs May taught her many things besides crochet. How to wind wool on, into an egg-shaped ball, how to run and fell and plan a darn, how to tidy a drawer, and to lay, like a blessing, above the contents a sheet of rustling tissue against the dust. Where's your work, child? asked Mrs May one day when Kate sat hunched and silent upon the hassock. You mustn't sit there dreaming. Have you lost your tongue? No, said Kate, pulling at her shoe button. I've lost the crochet hook. They were making a bed quilt in woollen squares and there were still thirty to do. I know where I put it, she went on hastily. I put it on the bottom shelf of the bookcase just beside my bed. On the bottom shelf, repeated Mrs May, her own needle flicking steadily in the firelight, near the floor. Yes, said Kate, but I looked on the floor, under the rug, everywhere. The wool was still there, though, just where I left it. Oh dear, exclaimed Mrs May lightly, don't say they're in this house too. The what are? asked Kate. The borrowers, said May, Mrs May, and in the half-light she seemed to smile. Kate stared a little fearfully. Are there such things? she asked after a moment. As what? Kate blinked her eyelids. As people, other people, living in a house who borrow things. Mrs May laid down her work. What do you think? she asked. Kate looked away. I don't know, she said, pulling hard at her shoe button. There can't be. And yet, and she raised her head, and yet sometimes I think there must be. Why do you think there must be? asked Mrs May. Because of all the things that disappear. Safety pins, for instance. Factories go on making safety pins, and every day people go on buying safety pins, and yet somehow there is never a safety pin just when you want one. Where are they all? Now, at this minute, where do they go? Take needles, she went on. All the needles my mother ever bought. There must be hundreds. They can't just be lying about this house. Not lying about the house, no, agreed Mrs May. But all the other things we keep on buying, again and again and again, like pencils and matchboxes and sealing wax and hair slides and drawing pins and thimbles and hat pins, put in Mrs May, and blotting paper. Yes, blotting paper, agreed Kate, but not hat pins. That's where you're wrong, said Mrs May, and she picked up her work again. There was a reason for hat pins. Kate, Kate stared. A reason, she repeated. I mean, what kind of reason? Well, there were two reasons, really. A hat pin is a very useful weapon, and, and Mrs May laughed suddenly, but it all sounds such nonsense, and uh, she hesitated. It was so very long ago. But tell me, said Kate, tell me, how do you know about the hat pin? Did you ever see one? Mrs May threw her startled glance. Well, yes, she began. Not a hat pin? exclaimed Kate impatiently. Uh, whatever you called them, a borrower. Mrs May drew a sharp breath. No, I never saw one. But someone else saw one, cried Kate, and you know about it. I can see you do. Hush, 
said Mrs May. No need to shout. She gazed downwards at the upturned face, and then she smiled, and her eyes slid away to, into the distance. I had a brother, she began uncertainly. Kate knelt upon the hassock, and he saw them. I don't know, said Mrs May, shaking her head. I just don't know. She smoothed her work out on her knee. He was such a tease. He told us so many things, my sister and me, impossible things. He was killed, she added gently, many years ago now on the northwest frontier. He became colonel of his regiment. He died what they called a hero's death. Was he your only brother? Yes, and he was our little brother. I think that's why, she thought for a moment, still smiling to herself. Yes, why he told us such impossible stories and such strange imaginings. He was jealous, I think, because we were older and because we could read better. He wanted to impress us. He wanted, perhaps, to shock us. And yet, she looked into the fire, there was something about him, perhaps because we were brought up in India, among mystery and magic and legend, something that made us think that he saw things that other people could not see. And sometimes we'd know he was teasing, but at other times, well, we were not so sure. She leaned forward and in her tidy way brushed a fan of loose ashes under the grate. Then, brush in hand, she stared again at the fire. He wasn't a very strong little boy. The first time he came home from India, he got rheumatic fever. He missed a whole term at school and was sent away to the country to get over it to the house of a great aunt. Later I went there myself. It was a strange old house. She hung up the brush on its brass hook and dusting her hands on a handkerchief, she picked up her work. Better light the lamp, she said. Not yet, begged Kate, leaning forward. Please go on, please, please tell me. But I've told you. No, you haven't. This old house. Wasn't that where he saw, he saw, Mrs May laughed, where he saw the borrowers? Yes, that's what he told us. Well, what he'd have us believe. And what's more, it seemed he didn't just see them, but he got to know them very well. And he became part of their lives, as it were. In fact, you might almost say he became a borrower himself. Oh, do tell me, please. Try to remember, right from the very beginning. But I do remember, said Mrs May. Oddly enough, I remember it better than many real things which have happened. Perhaps it was a real thing. I just don't know. You see... On the way back to India, my brother and I had to share a cabin. My sister used to sleep with our governess, and on those very hot nights, we often couldn't sleep, and my brother would talk for hours and hours, going over old ground, repeating conversation, and telling me details again and again, wondering how they were and what they were doing. They? Who were they, exactly? Homily, Pob, Pod, and little Ariati. Pod? Yes, even their names were never quite right. They imagined they had their own names, quite different from human names. But with half an ear, you could tell that they were borrowed. Even Uncle Hendr Hendreries and e Egaltinas, everything they had was borrowed. They had nothing of their own at all, nothing. In spite of this, my brother said they were touchy and conceited and thought they owned the world. How do you mean? They thought human beings were just invented to do the dirty work. Great slaves put there for them to use. At least that's what they told each other. But my brother said that underneath he thought they were frightened. And it was because they were frightened, he thought, that they had grown so small. Each generation had become smaller and smaller and more and more hidden. In the old days, days it seemed, and in some parts of England, our ancestors talked quite openly about the little people. Yes, said Kate, I know. Nowadays, I suppose, Mrs May went on slowly, if they exist at all, you would only find them in houses which are quite old and quiet and deep in the country, where human beings live to a routine. Routine is their safeguard and it enables them to organise their borrowing. They must know which rooms are being used and when. They do not stay long where, where there are careless people or unruly children or certain household pets. This particular old house, of course, was ideal, as far, far as some of them were concerned, a trifle cold and empty. Great Aunt Sophie was bedridden through a hunting accident some 20 years before, and as for other human beings, there was only Mrs Driver, the cook, Crampfell, the gardener, and at rare intervals, an odd housemaid or such. 
My brother too, when he went there after his rheumatic fever and had to spend long hours in bed. And for those first few, few weeks, it seems the Boris did not know of his existence. He slept in the old night nursery beyond the schoolroom. The schoolroom at that time was sheeted and shrouded and filled with junk. Odd trunks, a broken sewing machine, a desk, a dressmaker's dummy, a table, some chairs, a disused pianola, as the children who had used it. Great Aunt Sophie's children had long since grown up, married, died or gone away. The night nursery opened out of the schoolroom and from his bed my brother could see the oil painting The Battle of Waterloo which hung above the schoolroom's fireplace. And on the, on the wall, a corner cupboard with a glass door in it which was set out on hooks and shelves, a doll's tea service. Very delicate and old. At night, if the schoolroom door was open, he had a view down the lighted pas passage which led to the head of the stairs. It would comfort him to see each night at the it would comfort him to see each evening at dusk Mrs. Driver appear at the head of the stairs and cross the passage carrying a tray for Aunt Sophie with bath oliver biscuits and the tall cut glass decanter of fine old pale Madeira. On her way out, Mrs. Driver would pause and, and lower the gas jet in the passage to a dim blue flame, and then he would watch her as she stumped away downstairs, sinking slowly out of sight betw beneath, between the banisters. Under this passage, in the hall below, there was a clock, and through the night he would hear it strike the hours. It was a grandfather clock and very old. Mr. Firth of Leighton Buzzard came each month to wind it, as his father had come before him and his great uncle before that, for eighty years, they said. And to Miss, Mr. Firth's certain knowledge, it had not stopped, and as far as anyone could tell, for as, m from as many years before that. The great thing was that it must never be moved. It stood against the wainscot, and the stone flags around it had been washed so often that a little platform, my brother said, rose up inside. And under this clock, below the wainscot, there was a hole.